Thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Like we connected a few months ago and as I was sourcing out some guests, I was like, okay, obviously I need to get Lauren on. Yeah, duh. Duh. What am I doing? So to start, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, for anyone who doesn't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what your pronouns are and what you do? My name is Lauren Abedini, but I've been going by kittens for the last like 10 years. It's my DJ name that just kind of stuck. Um, I'm a DJ, music producer, podcast host. I teach some DJ workshops. I um, am an investor in a restaurant. I just kind of do a lot of little bits and that's fun. Um, pronouns, she, they. I'm very out lesbian, yes. um, half <laughs> Persian. Other half is a white American. So I kind of got some fun little experiences in life. And yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been actually following you for a few years now. Actually, before we connected about your podcast, I had already followed you on Instagram and that's why I saw, but um, I was so in awe of how much you were open about your sexuality. Like I I truly just saw your profile on Instagram and I was like, okay, this girl is so badass, like DJ out lesbian. And I was figuring myself out at the time. So really yeah. appreciate you for that. Uh, yeah. But I want to know more about your coming out experience as, I mean, a first generation Iranian American. I mean, you're half Persian. I'd like to know more about that. It's, I mean, I think one thing that is really important to stress is like, you never stop coming out. And so if I wanted to be really honest about my coming out experience, it's, it's spanned 18 years now. It's been 18 years of coming out over and over and over, but my initial coming out, I think was to myself. And that was when I was 15 and I met my first girlfriend through my friend who was like, I think I might be bi. And she, she just like had some guys screw her over. And she's like, I want to date girls. That'll be easier. That whole thing. Mm -hmm, that narrative. Yeah. And up until that point, I had never even, it had never crossed my mind that I might be queer. And then she started talking to this girl that was like one of her gay guy friends, lesbian friend, and they tried to connect them. And I was like, wait, what? And so I got really curious about like this person. I had never met a queer woman before. So I was just really, really curious about who this person was. And my friend did not end up dating her uh, because she is straight. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so I kind of took advantage of the chance to get to know her at this like random going away party my friend was having. So I got to know her there and then I connected with her on MySpace and we started just going to see different bands play together because we connected over music, whatever. At this point, still, it hadn't hit me that I might be into women like that. And up until this point, I had like one or two boyfriends for like a month. I had had like my first kiss and that was kind of it. Yeah. And I just knew like I wasn't boy crazy the way all my friends were. And I, I didn't know why I thought like, I don't know, I thought something was wrong with me. And then me and this girl had been hanging out for like a month and a half. And then she kissed me and it was like light bulb moment. Like everything suddenly made sense. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. This is a thing. Maybe I'm totally. by. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Like, you know, maybe this is what's going on. And then, um, I proceeded to fall in love with her and <laughs> as you do, you're like, yeah, we kiss obs obsessed. Immediately. I fell in love. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, and then it was like, it was that time in social media history where you kind of don't realize that everything is available on the internet to everyone and how accessible everything is. So I was posting pictures, like kissing my girlfriend and my dad was like, kind of, you know, lurking around as a parent should at that age, I was 15 and somebody also let him know to look at my myspace and so I kind of got outed but I also kind of outed myself I guess oh no but um, still I mean it's still kind of like your personal yeah. platform that you know like you feel comfortable posting to but I I got yeah. that that sucks I wasn't ready to tell him no um so he found out and then my mom found out before him because I had been dating this girl for like two months at this point and I was like all you know just obsessed and I, I was sick and she showed up at my house for Valentine's day with like candy and teddy bears and all this crap. And my mom was like, that's not just your friend. Is it? 
and I just like broke down and started crying and I was like I think I'm in love with her <laughs> and- oh my god and wait how old were you at this point 15 you're 15 wow oh my yeah. god yeah I came out young mm-hmm. um so yeah she was like she was cool she wanted to make sure it was more she was that she was concerned about the person I was dating because they were a bit older than me versus me being gay mm-hmm. and so she wanted to like make sure I talk to my therapist to like explore my feelings like what is this change what is happening and then over the years it, it was two very different experiences because my mom is very she grew up in the Bay Area and like San Francisco is very, very progressive, very liberal, very like, you know, she was going to concerts and doing all San Francisco in the sixties. Like she's that girl. I could only imagine what San Fran in the sixties would be. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was her vibe. And then my dad grew up in a very conservative family in Iran and is a professor and is very, you know, like, yeah, by the there book. we go. Yeah. And so it was two very different experiences and that side of my family, it was very much a like, don't ask, don't tell. Let's not talk about personal things in general. Like, I I think even if I was dating a man, it, we wouldn't talk about it. Mm. It it wouldn't be a thing. Got it. But obviously this was a a bigger one. And it was like, let's just keep this. Let's just not acknowledge it as much as possible. And the more I went through life, it became a thing where I was like, no, I need, I need you to acknowledge this because I need to feel like I'm seen. And so that side of my family, it continued to be a like very drawn out coming out process of like coming out about different things a little bit more and more and more and finding new ways to come out that like maybe this angle will work and they'll be like, okay, cool. That's uh, interesting. I never actually thought of it in that way, right? Like kind of trying out different things to see like what maybe might like settle in for them a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's there's a lot. I mean, I, I probably tried every angle possible. I tried the like, you need to accept me. And if you don't, I'm out of here. Like, you know, thankfully, I, my, my parents were divorced when I was really young. So mm, thankfully, okay. I had a, a safe space to go. It's not like I had to risk, you know, living on the streets if I came out. Mm-hmm. I just would go to my mom's house. Yeah. Um, But, you know, I tried that angle and that didn't work. And I tried just bringing things up casually, like, oh yeah, I'm going to Pride this weekend. And, blah, blah, blah. and you know, if I was dating dating someone and having a hard time with the relationship and I just needed like my dad's advice because he's like, he gives great advice, smart, mm-hmm. rational dude. And I'd be like, I need to talk to you about my relationship. Like, I just need your advice. And then I just kept trying more and more. And then eventually I, I spoke to um, my, one of my uncles who's very, he's very spiritual and just I don't know. He he's kind of like on an on another level of like awareness and everything. And he gave me some really good advice. When I came out to him initially, he was just like, "Okay, what's the problem?" So which I was shocked by, but he he gave me some really good advice of like, you know, you need to consider the person you're talking to and where they come from and trying to find a way to like make them comfortable and ease them into this because you can't force someone to change their lifetime of beliefs. And that sometimes is you so so true. Yeah, it's a really good way to, to say be it. patient. You yeah. have to be patient and and kind of meet them where they're at and and help guide them. And so I did that. I stopped being as like I don't know confrontational. I guess like reactive because I feel like mm-hmm. I think that's only natural though. For yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, you're like, why don't you accept me for this? And why don't you embrace it? It's one thing to accept; it's another to embrace. And so once I kind of backed off and tried a different angle it it really everything really changed like my dad and my girlfriend are like cool like he gets her Christmas presents and she comes to like the Persian holidays at the house so it's it's nice like even after all these years things can still change and people can still grow and you know everybody grows and can accept each other Mm -hmm. that's really heartwarming to hear too it's nice to kind of like see that when you can see your girlfriend and your dad just being together celebrating holidays I'm sure that moment for you was just like oh yeah oh that's nice yeah yeah lots lots of tears lots of tears lots of tears well you did you did touch upon a little bit that you thought you were bi was Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about labels in general I feel like labels can be very helpful and I myself actually identify as a lesbian or gay I say both but I'm just curious to know was there a moment when you realized like bi doesn't fit anymore? Yeah, I, um, 
because that was initially the thing because I was just like, okay, well, I've grown up like liking guys, which was just compulsory shit. And the more I connected with the girl I was seeing, which that was on and off. And I dated a bunch of other girls throughout, you know, that period of time. And in between, I would try to date guys because I thought like, you know, oh, this girl broke my heart. Maybe a guy won't. Maybe that's just, I'm just supposed to do this. And every time I tried to do that, it just reinforced how gay I was. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, fuck. Okay. Yeah. Like, I'm not into this. It was just like a quick, like, it would be a week of like trying to talk to a guy in high school and me being like, absolutely not. No fucking way. (laughs) Stay Um, away from me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, I think, knowing that I was able to fall in love with a woman and I, I never, I never had the capacity to even like get near an intense crush on a guy, let alone love one. Mm-hmm. That's where I was like, okay, yep. This is a thing. This, yeah. is, this is very much a thing. So you're very self-assured though. You know, I think that's very, very cool about you. I think it's less like you know, kind of dancing around the subject, with, which I think I did a lot when I was growing up. I was very much like unsure. And I think it's normal. Everyone's different, but I admire how like rational you, you sound as you're saying that. I think that's, that's pretty cool. It, I mean, it took time. It took a lot yeah. of time. Fair. And I think, I think that's another thing that is, it's kind of beautiful about where things are now in society. Cause back then, I mean, this was like, I'm really aging myself, but like I'm 33. So, and I came out when I was 15 and I was hanging out with only lesbians. And so there was also a very intense pressure to pick a side. There Mm -hmm. was much less acceptance of the spectrum of queerness. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, okay, I need to figure this out. I really need to figure this out because if I, if I was bi, I was going to stick to it. If I was a lesbian, I was going to stick to it. And I know. I mean, after all these years, obviously, I know I'm very much a lesbian, but but I, I'm just glad that there's that like space for people to just be and mm-hmm. explore whatever they may like, and not not be like, I don't know, punished for you it. You must be like, yeah, punished for it, and also, I mean, we're still working throughout like with things even in the queer community as well. I think with labels, totally. that's going to be an ongoing process. But you're right. I mean, in this day and age it's very much more accepted to kind of stay open and be like, I'm fluid, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's less emphasis on that. But um, you kind of mentioned that you didn't even think you were probably queer until you met your first girlfriend. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, were there moments in your childhood with like, if there were certain celebrities or yeah, like TV show characters that were like, oh, I was so gay. Yeah, exactly. Everything made sense. Literally like- I, um, I was uh, in dance class, like my whole, like all from when I could walk through college and, you know, dance studio, competitive teams and whatnot. And I had a crush on like multiple girls at my dance studio. Like I was so obsessed with them. I thought they were so cool and so beautiful. And I just like wanted to be near them. And I like, I knew I was being weird and I just didn't know what it was. And then looking back, I was like, oh, I just had a massive crush on them. Like, that's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. And same with like, I think my most vivid memory of like a media moment was watching Titanic in theaters. Really? What part? The scene where she's naked and getting drawn. (laughs) Actually, as I said that, I was like, (laughs) okay, I should (laughs) know. But like everyone I knew was just gushing over Leonardo DiCaprio and I was like did anyone see Kate Winslet naked like and I asked my mom because I couldn't stop thinking about it and I asked my mom I was like I can't stop thinking about that scene is that like weird and you know I really was like I feel like something's not right or not normal about what I'm thinking and she's like no 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 honey that's fine you know you're just you're just curious about like what your body might be like when you grow up and I'm like no not exactly. No, no, wrong, wrong. But that is so good. Actually, I haven't heard a lot of people say Titanic, which it should be. I mean, I feel like seeing Kate Winslet naked was like for me as a kid too. That I was like, oh my gosh, like mm-hmm. for sure. But and, um, and I feel like that scene specifically, like 
a lot of times when we see women in media, especially back then, it was very much male gazy and sexualized, but that scene was so like soft and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, I mean, he was drawing her naked, but it wasn't this like objectifying, uncomfortable moment. It was very tasteful and she seemed very comfortable and empowered. So I think that was another thing. She did. And I don't know if I'm making this up, but I, I heard it was one of the first scenes they shot actually. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I'm, I mean, I'm going to Google that after. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm <laughs> just see. spitting out facts, but yeah. I think they wanted to um, like kind of get that authentic like nervousness mm. as well from from Leo's yeah. reaction. And I'm going to look that up after, but I feel like it might have been. You did kind of touch upon this a little earlier, but what did you struggle with the most while discovering your sexuality? Like, do you think it was kind of more the family dynamic and or were there other factors? I think it was, I think it was really, I mean, the family dynamic was a big thing and feeling like I'm still worthy of being loved, even though I may be disappointing people um, because I'm not meeting the expectations. That was, that was a big thing for me. And like, I felt that all the way through, you know, adulthood up until not too long ago, Mm -hmm. but I think it was definitely that. And then, um, trying to figure out like do I like guys or do I like girls only and now we have so many resources to just you know like there's checklists for like are you a lesbian you know and people had Mm -hmm. google and I only had the l word like when it was originally out and like that was really it so I think the not knowing and trying to figure that out was a little weird because there was this there's a judgment of like are you with us or are you like not Mm -hmm. and so figuring that out was really tricky for me at least just I was so young um but now I'm just glad that there's so many resources for people and and open forums for people to talk because I felt I didn't know anyone who was newly queer was all like older established lesbians that is so people. true. Yeah. So I had no one to kind of figure it out with because I felt like if I was e- explaining like my exploration period and thought process, I'd immediately get like, oh, you're not even a lesbian. You're not even gay. So get out of here. Would you and get like your experimenting I vibes or what was it like? Totally. Yeah, totally. And which I get to because I kind of was. <laughs> I was, you know, I was young and I had didn't have much experience. So I was experimenting. And as I experimented, I really figured out like, okay, this is, this is really it, but it would have been nicer to have like a safe space to discuss my thoughts with like-minded people who are also exploring and experimenting, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you don't feel like you're like on your own little Island, just trying to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have anyone to talk to. So yeah. And that's hard too. like that. The L word was probably the only type of media representation you had, because Mm -hmm. I actually had my sister on recently. Um, She's eight years older than me. So she is 35. Mm -hmm. Um, I was trying to figure out if she knew I was gay as we were growing up together. And she's like, honestly, I think if we had more representation at the time she was a teen, she was like, honestly, I think I would have put more like two and two together about mm. the way you felt about your high school friend. Um, but she mentioned the L word too. She's like, I think that was the only thing that was on when I was growing up. Or if there was any rep, it maybe was like very minimal or it was kind like of Ellen. like a Exactly. And you look mm. for people you look like and you relate with, right? And I'm sitting there being like, if Ellen's gay, like I don't think I'm gay, you know? Exactly. Yeah, same. Yeah. There was there was no like there's no femme representation. There was no non-white representation. So it's like, yeah, how do you how do you figure yourself out when you don't see anyone that you can relate to? Like you're not going to it's going to take longer to figure shit out. 100%. I think um for me it was like Shay Mitchell and Pretty Little Liars was very mm very good for for me to see that at like 16 Mm -hmm. um but then other than that there was like a shot at love with tila tequila i remember watching when i was 12 christ i know i know wow that could be a whole other podcast episode 
Yeah, that whole, <laughs> that could be a whole podcast series. Honestly, it's that show is insane. Breaking it down episode by episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'll wow. I'll uh, hit you up. We can do that <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. God, let's get into your music career. You mentioned you're a DJ. Um, I want to know how did you get into it? It started out just as a experiment, a hobby, and it it just kind of turned into a whole career somehow. As as I said, like I grew up, I grew up as a dancer, so I always had a, a deep connection with music. When I was growing up, like I sh- I really shouldn't have been sneaking out, but when I was like 13, 12, 13, I started going to local shows and concerts and stuff. And so I was just finding new ways to engage with music. And my first girlfriend, who was, she was a few years older than me, she was a film student. And so she was going to these different clubs when, when DJ culture was really like blossoming at the time. It was like when Steve Aoki was really coming up and like Very DJ cool. AM, if you know who that is. So she would go to these clubs and film recap videos for them because that's how they promoted the nights so there'd be this like photographer that would take all these pictures this really popular photographer and then she'd do these cool recap videos every week so I would be able to sneak in with her and then I had my other like older lesbian friends who would just whoever looked enough like me I would use their IDs and we just amazing yeah and you're 13 no I did I wasn't going to clubs at 13 I was going to shows at 13 15 okay. I was going to clubs but still, okay yeah, so I was like hello young. yeah yeah no <laughs> um yeah, that would have been bad. I was I was going to shows I shouldn't have been going to, but yeah. but clubs was 15. Okay. And yeah, I was just kind of immersed in this different lifestyle and like nightlife. And that was a time when DJs were really kind of becoming a central part of an event. And then as I grew up, I started going to different things in the, the area, different music scenes that had DJs and producers that were more highlighted as artists versus just like the person at the party and that the the music and the way people were doing things was so different that I got really inspired and I really wanted to try but like major barrier to entry it was expensive turntables and you know buying records and like literally just just to start it's like three grand just startup cost yeah that's not easy to just be like okay cool great yeah no let's go no 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 and and then on top of it it was the same thing about the representation I didn't see anyone I it was literally like all men that I saw and there was maybe one one or two women who I couldn't identify with at all and so it took me a long time to kind of get the guts up to to start and thankfully I had a lot of guy friends who were just in the scene and they were excited to just teach me and help me because they knew how much I loved music. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it just kind of became a fun hobby for me to learn. And I started working at um, at this nightclub in LA while I was in college. So I was studying marketing. I was doing marketing for this club. And eventually I convinced them to let me DJ there. That's awesome. So I, somehow how did you do it, that like what did you say just because like it, it's helpful too that you were doing the marketing for them so were you kind of yeah like, yeah yeah so I was I was basically the assistant to the marketing director who Got was it. also the talent buyer and he knew that I you know he knew my music taste and so we really bonded over just music in general and he was able to basically get the approval to have me be the opening DJ and that's really cool yeah, I'm so grateful for that. Like I see him all the time still. We're still in touch. And I'm just like, dude, like that that started everything. Cause I, I wouldn't have had any of the opportunities after if it wasn't for that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I started I started DJing there, which that was like boot camp because I was used to like playing in my bedroom or like local small like gay parties at like small bars. Right. And this was massive bottle service like Vegas style club that is wild what was the club it was called Dre's called Dre's okay Mm -hmm. yeah I've heard of Dre's yeah it was right on Hollywood Boulevard now they they have one in Vegas also but yeah so I started doing that um and just kind of getting into that groove and learning and through that I was meeting all these different people who were agents or other DJs and 
because I would help set the DJs up after me. And so I just was able to connect with everyone. Mm -hmm. And then I got a really good opportunity with um, Kid Cudi to be his tour DJ in 2013. Oh my God. Yeah. That's incredible. (laughs) I love it. It's like such a natural flow, I feel like for you, you know? Yeah. It just feels very meant to be. Yeah. I was just kind of following the opportunities that were presented and doing as much as I could with them. And at this time I was still in college. I was like finishing up my last semester while I was touring with Cuddy, while I was still handling marketing for this club. I don't know how the fuck I did that. That's so busy. Juggled it. Yeah. I don't know how, but yeah, anyways, the club closed and I was like, okay, I can either like find another job. I just graduated college. What do I want to do? And I gave myself six months to just see through the DJing thing and see like, okay, can I, can I like make ends meet and really like survive off of this and make Mm -hmm. this a thing? Or do I need to just go get another job? And I've never had to get another job since. Good for you. I love that. And it's just, you're being realistic, right? And believing in yourself. I feel like for a lot of creative fields, it's really easy to get in our own heads and be like, well, I can't do that. Like, how could I? And you just had that drive and that's awesome. What did you think you would be like before DJing? Like if you had like a backup? I was actually a makeup artist and in the beauty industry, um, I worked for Mac for like five years. Oh, wow. Four years. Yeah. Nice. I, so I was doing, and even in high school before that, before I turned 18, cause you have to be 18 to work at Mac before that I was working at like the makeup counters in department stores. Okay. So makeup was my thing. Like I was sure that was what I was going to do. And when I was going to college, I was like, okay, like I'll get my degree. And then my cat's trying to get in here. I was like, I'll get my degree and then I'll do marketing for beauty brands. Mm -hmm. Like that was my whole plan. And, um, and then I got in a car accident and realized like, I don't like this industry. I just, it didn't feel right. And I kept hitting weird walls that I was like, this is a sign I'm not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. And so I quit. And thankfully I knew a bunch of people in the like nightlife scene in LA because I was going to clubs so young. Mm -hmm. You have connections. Yeah. I was like, Hey, can you find me a job? Like, I was like, I don't know. I'm down for whatever. Like if you think I should like be a bartender or like, you know, whatever. And he's like, I got the thing for you. Like you're, you're smart enough to do this job. So let's, let's put you there. Yeah. Just kind of all fell together. Yeah, it really did. I, well, yeah, it's, it's weird when you think about it like that, when you look back and you, you can see how it all just flowed. As I was like looking into this and doing a little research before the interview, I saw that you had hosted these like power workshops, um, like teaching people how to DJ. And I'm just curious, like, tell us a little bit about that. And are you planning on hosting any more in the future? Yeah. Hold that thought. I'm getting my cat's like dying to get in. Sure. No worries. Come here. You are just crying for attention. So cute. To be honest, I I actually wanted to just interview your cat. So we'll just take it from here. (laughs) That was my whole She's here. You guys planned this. You guys planned this, huh? I I when you were talking, I was like texting her, just being like, come through, disturb right now. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so power, I started that because. I remembered how I didn't have someone to look up to and feel like, I don't know, like I could connect with in the DJ world. And I didn't want that for other people. I'm like, there's, I'm sure there's so many people that want to learn and there's all these fucking barriers. Everything is expensive. It's a bunch of guys. There's, it's just doesn't feel inviting unless you have all these resources. So I was like, let me, let me just provide the resources so that people can have a day to just like get their feet wet and have a chance to be like, do I like this enough to really like pursue it and Mm -hmm. sort of break the ice with the learning. And I wanted to make sure it was a really safe space. So it was women only queer people, you know, anyone of a marginalized gender identity was welcome. And it is just fun. We all like learn the basics of DJing. Everyone gets to connect and like make friends. And we bring like a bunch of stuff to donate to local shelters. So if people wanted to bring, you know, whatever clothes and toiletries, 
Goodbye. Okay. Oh, great. She just left me covered in cat hair. Um, <laughs> um yeah so people can bring stuff to donate and then all of the ticket sales uh the profit from the ticket sales would be donated to a local shelter as well that's amazing and so fun so fulfilling really exhausting but honestly I loved it so much and I was really bummed when COVID happened because I was planning to do a whole power tour in like all the major cities. Oh yeah. T- the timing with COVID too. It's just big shutdown. So what can you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, now we're just kind of, I, I didn't want to do it virtual because that's just not the vibe. Like I liked going around and being able to be hands-on and it's hard to teach DJing through like verbal explanations. You kind of have to like adjust certain things physically. Mm -hmm. Totally. It helps to also have that in-person interaction, like just to be there, it's comfortable and you can actually like really see, I couldn't imagine doing it like virtually. I I don't know. I I know it's possible, but it would be harder, I think. No. And that way too, like we provide all the equipment so um, people can use what is in actual clubs and really experience that instead of having to you know, get some really cheap app that's maybe not as good or that is so true. You know, just yeah. Wanted to give people the chance. So do or do you think it's gonna happen again or are you kind of like it's not really on your mind right now and there's no set plans yet. Um, but I really, really want to make that happen this year. So mm-hmm. it just kind of is a logistics thing at this point. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'll have some some dates to announce soon. That's fair. Well if you're ever in Toronto I'll oh be yeah, we, we, I definitely want to do one in Toronto. That'd be fun. Actually, no. Um, I know a couple people that do something kind of similar. I believe it's in, in Toronto, or maybe it was Vancouver, called Inner Sessions. Hmm, they, I think they started cool. it shortly after I did Power. I don't know, but yeah, similar vibe. Really fun. That's awesome. And I actually would go uh, to a workshop or check it out because my friend gave me his turntable. Um, oh, nice. And that was something I was like, oh, I, it was kind of a COVID. Thing for me to learn like over the pandemic and I was playing around with mm-hmm. it but I was like oh it would be awesome to kind of like be with other people learning at the same time because I was also intimidated I was like yeah. okay where does she start <laughs> yeah it's 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 a yeah. lot it's a, it's a lot it's frustrating it's a lot of information it's remembering a lot of things at the same time which is not easy <laughs> no yeah. but that's awesome how did you come up with the name kittens how did that happen so my my boss at the time when I was working at that club, he basically was like, you need to change your fucking name because <laughs> I had a different name. What was your name? It was, I was going through this whole, like, I'm evolving and like, I don't know. I was going through this thing at the time that I started DJing. And so I was like, well, I'm going through this like soul renaissance. And then I decided to just shorten that to soul ray with a little accent over the E. Got it. Okay, yep. Sol Ray. Yep. Yeah. So I was Sol Ray. Shout out to anyone who remembers that because I've ran into people be like, what's up, DJ Sol Ray? Uh-huh. Um, but he was like, yeah, you know, you're you're starting to like get a name for yourself because I had been DJing more at the club and getting better opportunities. And he's like, Sol Ray's got to go. Mm, okay. And he was kind of a real one for that, so, I guess, coming through. Like, yeah. Which I, yeah. yeah, I appreciate. I appreciate that because I would not be happy to be stuck with Sol Ray right now. But I was trying to think of a name and it's really hard to think of what to name yourself, you know, hundred percent. It's something that kind of has to just come up. And so we were like bouncing ideas around for like weeks and everything sounded lame to me. And it was at this time where there was this video going viral on YouTube. This was in like 2012. And it was these little orange kittens on turntables that were turning and they're all like wobbling and falling all over. And I kid you not, like, I would get sent that 90 times a day from different people being like, oh, look, it's you, it's you. And I'm like, everybody associates me with cats already. And and I don't know. So I had finally gotten it sent another time and I was in the car with my old boss driving. And I'm like, can I just fucking call myself kittens at this point and be done with this? Because like people just, you know, they kept sending me that. And he's like, that's actually kind of cool. And I was like, okay, done. And kittens just works. I don't even know like, what it is but you like look like you'd be a kittens and it's just like (laughs) like, it's really it was a it was a bad it was a bad decision for like seo purposes because if you're trying to google me good luck 
you have to put like so true. kittens DJ or like I am kittens or like Lauren kittens. Otherwise, not happening. Yeah. Because I, yeah, I think if I look you up now, I feel like a lot of you kind of go by like Lauren kittens, Abadini, right? So I think that that would help you for sure. Yeah, that's what I had. That's what I had to kind of like put in there so that people know that I am not just kittens because it's really hard to look me up. Otherwise. Totally. Yeah. You're like, I love the cat content, but hi, I'm here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. So, you know, I love she, her, they. I love your podcast and um, definitely wanted to have you on to also talk about that because you released she, her, they. Was it in 2021? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, twenty like, like summer of twenty twenty one. Awesome. It's long ago. Yeah, and I can't believe we're in twenty twenty three. Like sometimes when I look back, I'm like, oh my god, two years. How? Yeah. How? How are we here? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. But how did you, or what inspired you to start it? To start a podcast. So I had actually wanted to start a podcast, and I was pitching one um, early twenty nineteen. And I was just going to call it power, just kind of like the workshops and have it be an extension of that. And I was planning on having um, guests who are of like marginalized backgrounds that were doing inspiring things. And then, you know, whatever life happened. And then I made this playlist randomly because I was coming across so many queer women who were in music, like new artists. I, there weren't There weren't as many Spotify playlists as there are now, but... I was like, there isn't a discovery space just to highlight queer women in music. And there's so many, it's just like new ones popping up every day. So I wanted to have a space for that. And so I was, you know, anyone I came across, I'd put in there, I'd have people send submissions in. And then as time went on, like a few months later, I was like, you know what? I know a lot of these people. So it would be cool to just have them tell their stories and have that representation so that people could hear the experiences and everything from like creative inspiration to how people figure themselves out and overcame their own obstacles mm -hmm. in a different space. So yeah, after making this whole playlist, I realized like, I know all these people, so I should just make a podcast to highlight them and how they figure themselves out, what they still struggle with and talk about music and all that stuff. And so it was like literally in the beginning of the pandemic, I just was sending out Zoom links to friends and recorded with very little knowledge about um, sound quality and video editing and um, ended up with the first few episodes of that. And here we are two years later. Totally. And now you you are expanding to outside of the music scene, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And also, cause originally it was very much just for like queer women in music. Mm -hmm. And my whole goal was to have it be for people who transcend identity expectations, but through like my lens as a queer woman, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Totally. So, so this season I'm having, um, I have a trans guy on who, uh, my friend Jordan, his episode is up already. He's amazing. Um, he's actually in the new Pretty Little Liars. And I need then, to check it out. I, I honestly have it on my yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, and then I have like a non-binary Persian uh, content creator that I love named Sirus. Like they're wonderful. And yeah, just I, I wanted to highlight people who just have different stuff going on that maybe don't get enough shine or have an interesting story. And always kind of keeping like, queer women and people who are underrepresented at the forefront of things, but anything that's kind of related to that, it's going to be starting to sp sprinkle in. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, media representation or queer media representation is so important. Like I can't stress it enough. I feel like even on girl on girl, we talk about it probably like every episode, like there's something that comes up that's surrounding queer media. And for me, why I resonated so much with your podcast when it came out, couple years ago, I was like, these are the conversations I need to be hearing. And I really resonate with a lot of these people's stories. So yeah, like appreciate you for doing that and like putting that content out there because we luckily, like we have so much more content to consume now. And I always say like, oh my God, if I was 15 listening to your podcast, oh, I'd be, that'd be amazing. But 
you're still making an impact in that way. And you have for many years because you're so outspoken. So yeah, thank just want to say thank you for that. And <laughs> yeah, this, this is probably like, there's probably not even one answer for this, but like, why is queer media representation so important? Like, I just want to hear your take on that. I mean, I think there's, there's multiple, there's multiple answers for that. One is just having that representation to normalize things. There was just some meme going around today that I saw about how something like 7% of Americans identify as queer now, and that's doubled in the last few years. And all these conservative Republicans are just like losing their shit, like, oh, they're bad influence. But it's not that. It's because there isn't, there's, there's space and people aren't being punished for being themselves. And so they're not scared to explore or come out or just like be open about their identity. So it's not that all these people weren't queer before. It's just, they weren't saying it. They weren't being open about it. They weren't giving themselves the permission to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think media representation really just gives people permission to be themselves. And that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And it normalizes it for people who are not queer to see what being queer can look like. You can be literally anyone from any ethnic background, any, you know, socioeconomic background, you can be masculine, you can be feminine, you could be everything in between. Mm -hmm. And that is all valid and okay and normal. Mm -hmm. So I think, Very. I think just the more we can see that stuff, the better. Oh yeah. The better. And actually what you, what you had said, have you read um, the book Untamed by Glennon Doyle? No, I have it downloaded and I haven't read it. Okay. Let me know what you think about it because there's just this part, it, it won't give anything away really, but there's just this part where she, I think is on like a book tour or at some press conference and someone asks her like, why is everyone so gay all of a sudden? She's like, I'm not trying to be um, like ignorant, but I just want to know, but people have been gay. You know what I mean? But we've yeah. been gay. <laughs> like, But exactly yeah. like you said, growing up in a society where it wasn't normalized, people repress and repress and shove it, shove it right down. So mm -hmm. that is why, like you said, media rep is important. We need to see ourselves. Otherwise we're invisible, you know? Exactly. Or exactly. you feel invisible. Yeah. Yeah. And just being able to for younger people to figure themselves out too, because, or even older people, I know a lot of people just haven't started questioning their identity until later in life. And it doesn't come until they see somebody that they're like, oh, that look, that person is like me and they're expressing feelings that I have. Maybe that's what this is. And the unknown confusion about somebody's identity and thinking they're weird or something's wrong with them, you can finally put language to that and validate that feeling and skip a lot of the like confusing bullshit that comes with figuring yourself out. I know for sure. And it's hard sometimes. Cause I, I mean, I grew up in Whitby, Ontario. So like from Toronto, it's about an hour away, but it's very mm -hmm. like small town vibes, like very white, very hetero. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like maybe growing up in Toronto, maybe would have been a different experience for me because I moved oh. out when I was 17 and kind of came straight to Toronto, but mm. you grew up in Los Angeles, right? I, so I grew up in this, like the suburbs. So I was maybe like 30 minutes out from downtown. Um, so still like, it's kind of a different world out there, but I spent a lot of time in the city. So I kind of, I feel like I got a balance mm, once I was able it. to start driving at least right before that. When my friends started being able to drive, I guess. Yeah, because I, I was just thinking, too, for people who grow up in really small conservative towns, like, that's tough because you kind oh of only God. see what is around you. Um, mm -hmm. So any any type of queer media rep is important or, like, kind of using, like, your TikTok or your Instagram to also connect with other queer mm -hmm. creators or queer people. Like, you can actually really make friends through that, which I think is really for important. Sure. Find your community. Because I mean, before we had any of that, before we had social media or any kind of like proper media representation, you're in the small ass town and you like don't don't know how, where it's safe to be yourself or how to explore that or how to validate that. And you just have to risk like leaving everything you know to figure yourself out. 
which Mm -hmm. that's, I can't imagine, I can't imagine how scary that is. It's very scary because there's like also an inner confidence to do that, that a lot of people need and it's there, but you have to kind of own it. And I can only imagine how many people would be like, I can't, or it's just easier if I just settle. I don't know. Could go on about that forever. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. I cannot imagine. Um, I only have a couple more questions for you because we are about to wrap soon, but what advice do you have for people who are thinking of coming out or are in the process? My advice for people coming out would be number one, make sure you're safe. Make sure it's actually safe for you to come out because anyone can tell you to come out and like be yourself, whatever. But if you are not going to be safe, like keep that as a priority first. But aside from that, I think keep in mind who you're coming out to and strategize, strategize the delivery, because that makes such a huge difference. And at the end of the day, we want to get to a point where whoever we're talking to will be able to see us and accept us and embrace us. And it's really hard to do that if you're kind of throwing a lot of intensity or expectations or I don't know, certain energy at somebody that is going to throw their defenses up. Yeah. So strategizing really helps consider what their background is, what their beliefs are, what their concerns are and reassure them in the process. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that I think is so helpful is you can say to say a conservative parent, like, Hey, this is me. I will always value family. I will not do anything to embarrass you. I will always respect X, Y, Z, but me loving who I want to love or being myself is not going to do that. But don't worry, I'm not going to like be be crazy out here. Like finding those things to to like soften the blow, I guess, if you're dealing with somebody or a family that kind of sucks in that way, Mm -hmm. I think that really helps. So safety and strategy. That's really good advice. It's really good advice because I feel like, I mean, even for me, I I would always be so headstrong and be like, why can't people just understand? Like, mm-hmm. you know, you love who you want to love. Like, why does that matter to somebody else? But you're right. Like people grow up with different beliefs and their environment and that's all they know. So, I mean, it's it's about strategy, like you said, and kind of being patient or even allowing them to like take that information and be like, sit with it and Mm -hmm. we can chat. I'm here to communicate rather than totally where I've definitely been like, well, if you can't accept me, then I I would, I would. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Like fuck right off. But I also have to realize like, it's not always like, as long as people are willing to learn and accept, I always have more of that empathy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Cause some people do need to be told to fuck off and like, that's fine, but you at least got to like, you want to increase your chances of a successful coming out and reduce your risk. And so then just a little bit of strategy and yeah. Lastly, do you have any like upcoming projects that you want to plug and where can our listeners keep up with you? She, her, they is, is on and popping. So you can find that um, on my page on Instagram at I am kittens or at she, her, they on Instagram Or if you go to www.sheherthey.com, it's links for all the things, the original playlist, the show, you can watch it on YouTube or any streaming podcast platforms. Um, Other than that, I'm working on music and going to be back out on the road soon. And what else? I feel like that's, those are, those are the main ones. Those are kind (laughs) of big things though. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully more fun stuff soon. Cool. Yeah. Well, appreciate you once again. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, yeah, I think the listeners um, for our pod are really, really going to love this and yeah, I've been wanting to have you on for a while. So yeah, this is great. I'm glad it worked out with with timing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Me. 